Well, you know, it's like you're you're like a crazy waitress and you're writing these stupid novels on your little typewriter sitting on the floor and you don't have a television and your life is looking very gray and yet somehow you decide you're going to have a lesbian protagonist even though you know it's the kiss of death. And you're like, why am I doing this? And then you think, well, maybe sometime in the future some woman, some young women will like it. And it happened. <laughs> it's just absolutely incredible. That's the part that's so amazing. So thank you so much, all three of you and, and all of you. And there are people here, like my neighbors of 40 years are here. Margo, we've known each other since we were three. Some of my best friends are here. It's just wonderful. Thank you all so much. My neighbor, Julian and Tim and... Charles and Jackie and Lana and Kelly and everybody. <laughs> okay. I picked this section for a very specific reason that will be revealed at the end. So just remember, this was published in 1988, which means it was written in 1986. I was on my second one, staring at the still blinking leftover Christmas lights when a female voice came to me from the other end of the bar. It started as a tickle in my ear, and then for a second, I thought someone had the sense to record a quiet rap song. But when she got so close, I could see her reflection in my ice. I realized that a real person was talking to me, a blonde. Hey, she said, pulling up a bar stool. You want to buy a phone machine for $10? <laughs> we drank for a while until the girl asked if I wanted to see the machine. I was tired and needed to talk, so I just decided to tell her the truth. I can't. I have to give Priscilla Presley back her gun. Do you have to do it right now? I guess it can wait. I'll show it to you if you want to see it, but we have to go into the bathroom. No thanks, I've seen guns before. You look kind of sad. I am sad. Somebody played Patsy Cline on the jukebox, and that made me even sadder, but in a pleasurable, melancholy way, not a painful, Dolores-type way. Look, she said in adolescent earnest as I watched her recite from memory, you have the possibility to make your life beautiful, but possibility is not forever, and it's not immediate. Know what I mean? Who told you that? Charlotte, that's my girlfriend, so you want to see the machine or not? First, though, the girl had to call her friend who was getting an abortion the next day to see if she needed her to go along or not. It was the last cold night in March, and the wind was blowing dark and ugly. She used the payphone on the corner as I huddled in the doorway with a cigarette and tried to push away the tiredness. You got your period, she shrieked. That's great. <clears throat> See, the girl seemed only five or six years younger than me, but she was from a whole different generation. She wore those black tights and black felt mini skirt and oversized shirt that everybody wore. Her hair was cut short on one side and long on the other, with blonde added to the tips. My head was still in the 60s. The only thing that happened in the last two decades that made any sense to me at all was Patti Smith. When Patti Smith came along, even I got hip, but then she went away. How did she schedule an abortion without a pregnancy test, I asked, following her little leather cap and one dangling earring. I don't know, but she got her period. Isn't that great? She started walking east and then more east until it was too east. There I go again, I thought, being old-fashioned. The idea that Avenue D is off limits was a thing of the past. Now white people can go anywhere. Where are we going? Charlotte's place. I have the key. How did you know it was OK to come out to me so quickly, I asked. Easy. Charlotte taught me the trick. She says that if you're talking to a woman and she looks you in the eye and really sees you and listens to what you have to say, then you know she's gay. <laughs> it works every time. Charlotte sounds like a pretty unusual person, I said. Yeah, the girl answered, not noticing the cold men in thin jackets staring silently as we passed by. 
It's funny having Charlotte's key. It's like an older person. Well, how old is she? 38. My father's 40. Why do older people always have keys? Because older people have apartments. <laughs> They're not moving around, staying different places. They know where they live. <laughs> Let's get some beer, she said, heading for the yellow light of a bodega, presiding over the steely emptiness of Avenue C. I watched the Spanish men watching her. She was so young, she had no wrinkles on her face and wore a childish blue eyeliner passing for sophistication. Let's get a quart bottle of Bud and a small bottle of Guinness and mix it. <laughs> it's not too bad. I handed her $2 over the stacks of stale Puerto Rican sweets and shivered. Even the apartment was cold. We make love here in the afternoons while Beatrice is away. Charlotte says she likes the smell of young flesh. She says it smells like white chocolate. Old flesh smells like the soap you use in the morning until it's really old and then it starts to rot. My grandmother used to smell that way, but I loved her, so it smelled good. One time, Charlotte and I came up here and an old man passed us on the stairs. I can't stand that smell, Charlotte said. It's weak and worse than garbage. But I was happy because it reminded me of my grandmother. When you love someone, they always smell good. Want to hear a record? She was smoking camels without filters and playing albums by groups I had never heard of. Listen to this version of Fever. It's Euro trash, you know, French New Wave. Instead of the word fever, she says tumor. Tumor all through the night. We sat and listened. My punkette sprawled out on the floor, me freezing in the only chair. That was great, she said, pouring more beer. Let's hear it again. Her hands were short and white with badly painted black nails. I'm so in love with Charlotte, she said. How do you know, I asked. Well, she's strong and she's a good lover. You think I'm young, but I know the difference. I know that she and Beatrice love each other and I'm trying hard to see it from Beatrice's point of view so that someday we can all be friends. But for now, I don't mind seeing her afternoons, I guess. I have to work mostly nights anyway, just a couple of lunches. I go-go dance in New Jersey. Told you that, right? On New Year's Eve, I was so coked up after work and wanted to spend the night with her so badly that I wandered into the cubby hole at 4.30 in the morning and they still made me pay. She had drunk all the beer by that time and smoked all her cigarettes. I gave her some of mine. Thanks. So there was this yuppie girl there talking to me and I was so desperate I would have gone home with her but she didn't ask. Charlotte encouraged me to take that job. Dancing, it's not too bad. Want to see my costume? She went into the next room to change and I started smoking. It was so cold, I had on a sweater and two blankets and was still chattering. Okay, she shouted from behind the door. Now sing some tacky disco song. Bad girl, <laughs> I sang. <laughs> Talking about a bad, bad girl. And then she came go-going in in her little red sparkle G-string string and black high heels. Her breasts were so small, she could have been a little girl showing off her first bikini. She bit her lip, trying to look sexy, but she just looked young. I segued into the next song. Ring my bell, ring my bell, my bell, ring-a-ling-a-ling. Sometimes they hold up 20s, she said, still dancing. But when I boogie over to take them, they give me singles instead. Sorry, honey. Then I saw her eyes. They were smart. They were too smart for me. Charlotte says there's a palm at the end of the mind, and it's on fire. What does that mean? And I thought, this kid can get anything she wants, anything. She saw me staring at her eyes and got scared all of a sudden, like she was caught reaching into her daddy's wallet. I've never done that for someone I respected before. Those breasts, I thought, how could anyone make love to those breasts? There's nothing there, nothing at all. Do you think Charlotte will leave her? What do you think? You really believe in love, don't you, I said. 
She looked up at me from her spot on the floor, totally open. Look, I don't know what you want from me. I said, I'm the last person in New York City you should be asking about relationships. <laughs> Do you think she'll leave her? And then I realized she saw something special in me. She trusted me. And I was transformed suddenly from a soup-stained waitress to an old professor. We were sitting not in a Lower East Side fire trap, but before a blazing hearth in a woodlined brownstone. Charlotte was my colleague, and Punkett, her hysterical mistake. <clears throat> Look, I said, sometimes you have to cheat on your wife, and sometimes you have to go back to her. I looked into her eyes again. They were really listening. Maybe you'll get what you want, I said, but you have to be patient. And suddenly, I wanted her so badly. I wanted to throw off the blankets and be vulnerable again, to roll on the rug with a little punkette and a red G-string, and I wanted to show her a really good time. Nostalgia. Thank you. <laughs> You guys hear me? Thank you so much. That was wonderful. And thank you three for coming and everybody for coming and indulging me in my like obsession <laughs> with this book. Um, <clears throat> I want to start off with just from the two of you, the sorry, this question excludes you, but I would love to hear about the first time that you read this book because like it had such an effect on me. I want to hear about other people's experiences. Do you want to start, Kay? Or, or Tina. No, go for it. Okay. Um, I, uh, sure. I mean, one first, it's great to be here. Um, yeah, sorry. I'm like cutting right to it. <laughs> and uh, Sarah, it's just wonderful to hear you read from it. Um, I, I don't have a really interesting origin story. Um, um, you like like the first time I read it is what you want to. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Or like, why has it stuck with you? Yeah. You know? So I'm. Um, I mean, I guess like I don't. I don't think I have a, a really interesting like origin story for for encountering after Dolores. Um, uh, you know, I, it's it's a it's been a book um, on my radar for uh, for a long time. But I, I will say I will say a couple of things. One is that rereading it before this panel, um, I uh, I recently like nine months ago, but recently got out of a relationship, and a relationship I'd been in for a very long time, and a lesbian relationship, and we were going to get married. And then, <laughs> and then, and then we broke up, because, you know, life happens, shit happens. Um, and uh, um, uh, it was a very amicable, unlike the narrator in Dolores, it was a very amicable split. Um, <laughs> uh, no guns involved, but um, uh, reading, um, like rereading this, I was like, oh, all of those like sour feelings, that strikes a note, huh? <laughs> um, <laughs> so so there's so you know, there's there's a there's a personal connection there. Um but I guess like, you know, um what after Dolores I think like does for me or what is it what it enables for me um is one, I think it's like a really fascinating novel about solidarity. Which is kind of a perverse thing to to say, maybe. And and Sarah, may, maybe you will step in and disagree. Um, uh, so I'll be interested to hear what you think. Um, but um, it's may, so it's maybe a perverse thing to say about like a lesbian detective story, um, which offers absolutely no comic resolution, um, and you know the narrator and Dolores don't. Like, like, like they're, they're, all you see is like basically splintered relationships, I think, by the, by the end of the novel. But um, on the one hand, I think like the, um, like Sarah, the way that you talk about the narrator working at Herbie's is actually shot through with moments of, of, of um, solidarity between mm -hmm. the workers in that shop. So like when the narrator um, like says to Joe, the cook who can't read, like, like she's like whispering the orders to him. Um, or like at the end of the novel when her drinking's really overtaken her and um, Dino takes her to a 12-step program. Like there are, there are these moments when, when you like, you're, you're actually like, um, the novel kind of turns to you and says, like, what, how about that, you know? Um, so, so, like, that's interesting. And on the other hand, there's all these lesbians who are at each other's throats. Mm -hmm. um, so, 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 like, that's, that's, not, that's not solidaristic, right? Um, that's, that's kind of the opposite of that. Um, but I think that, you know, you have, like, Charlotte and Beatrice, um, 
uh, the, the married couple who are kind of fighting, kind of in, in love and, 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 and have built up a web of lies. And, and like you have Ponquette who, who dies um, and you have the narrator and then Dolores and her girlfriend. Um, and just, and then like Priscilla Presley and the woman that she like cusses out of the start. So like all of these lesbians and they're all fighting um, and they're all lonely and sad and desperately poor. Um, most of them are desperately poor. Um, but I think like when you look at that, you actually see something like a film negative of solidarity. Um, and again, I think like the novel sort of turns to you and says like, what would it mean for there to be like a world in which um, like uh, gay women are, to, are, are, are fighting together instead of um, like stabbing each other in the back? Um, and I think like that's, it, it, that's like the provocation um, of After Dolores, and that's why I returned to it. Yeah, I definitely, oh, sorry, no, I didn't no, want no to interrupt. Um, no, I hear what you're saying, like, especially, it seems like to me, like, the the, hand, the handful of times I've read this book, it's always come to me at the exact right time for my, my, like, emotional state at that time, and I also reread it during a really, well, my breakup was extremely messy. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it just, it had that, that resonance to me in that moment, you know, for that reason, so I can relate. Sorry, I didn't want to cut uh, you off. No, no. Uh, so, well, the first thing that I just want to say is that this is the copy of um, this book that I uh, that I read for the first time, and upon rereading it, discovered that when I purchased it at a, a used bookstore, <laughs> this was the um, bookmark in it. So it feels feels very appropriate for a dyke book. Um, I. Uh, what you just said, Kay, is so fascinating, and it made me think of one of the things that re that really stood out to me upon rereading it um, is how not to like put myself on the couch, but like how like controlled my emotions and like feels are like during all of my breakups, and like reading this. Um, the whole time I was just like, snap out of it, girl, snap out of it, girl, like, get over it. And then I forgot this character of Coco Flores, and uh, who is, who is um, uh, not, not to be like, I identify with the like super cool character, um, but <laughs> I did, just, like, that is exactly what Coco Flores does. She just like, she comes in and much, I think, also like me is like, now that we're hanging out, I'm going to like narrate my life to you like a story, and whether you like it or not. Um, and uh, and and then also is constantly just being like, I actually never really liked her very much, and she is just actually really a figment of your imagination, and this is not really about her. And uh, I was like, yeah, that that you're right, Coco Flores. I don't know. Um, so I, I mean, I guess. And she is also a character who, th like, their friendship is solidarity. Mm. Like, even even when she's, like, smacking her upside the head, mm. like, that's an expression of friendship, you know, mm. um, to be like, you need somebody to, I mean, you need somebody to, like, put their hand in the spin cycle of your, like, self-destructive behavior. <laughs> um, and... Uh, and she, all of her relationships, I mean, whether she's like over romanticizing her relationships or not, like they don't seem fractured. To totally. Um, yeah, I mean, like it's interesting to bring up Coco Flores because I think like one thing that's totally fascinating about, um, about this novel is the central like long-term effective relationship in the in the narrator's life is not a romantic one it's not a, it's, it's like it, i mean she has like a lot of great sex a lot of extremely well written really hot sex um <laughs> but like but like the central like relationship isn't a uh, love it's friendship and it's friendship with um it's friendship with this other character who she also treats really badly and then mm. and then you know like in the, the kind of final scene they have a a moment of reconciliation mm. um uh, I think that that's really interesting, and it's really interesting in terms of like being antagonistic towards, like, the bourgeois novel that's about that's about like you know like the couple form and like the couple gets together and then splits up and then gets back together. And I mean you know like you can think of like 
gay versions of that novel. You can think of lesbian versions of, of that novel. Um, I mean, just, just to pick someone who I like being nasty to, like, like Michael Cunningham, like writes, you know, like writes these novels, um, uh, which, which are like, basically they are, like the, the characters are only very contingently gay. You could write basically those same stories about heteros, about like a, like a straight couple. Mm -hmm. um, that's not like, after Dolores isn't about like the couple form, you know what I mean? Well, you know, in in my overachieving like uh, reading up uh, on <laughs> on like everything online uh, about this book, including like the your intro that is in this edition, um, I I was also really struck by how much focus there, how much focus you put on, and like June Thomas from uh, from Slate also like talked very personally about. Um, like familial homophobia, basically, which is also the um, subject of uh, one of your nonfiction books. And you know, when I first read After Dolores, I wasn't picking up on any of that at all, which is odd. It's not like I have no familial homophobia in my life. <laughs> um, uh, but I, I don't know. It, it was. Um, it really. It made me think about it in a different way. That the specific ways that that relationships play out, whether they're friendships or uh, breakups or even the um, professional relationships like with the other working class mm. folks in the restaurant um, are all just so informed by the trauma of homophobia. And um, I don't know if I have anything to say about that, except that maybe, I, I guess it would be interesting to talk about how that trauma has changed in the past 30 years and how it hasn't um, because it it seems so much starker here. I don't know, actually. Maybe it's just because it's a drama. <laughs> and so it seems starker than uh, what we see in queer literature now or or what um, what we see in queer life. I don't know. What do you guys think about that? Well, you mentioning, and please feel free to interrupt me if I get this completely wrong, but you mentioning um, Ties That Bind, uh, mm -hmm. Sarah's nonfiction book about familial homophobia. Um, I I believe at some point in that book, you kind of talk, you talk about that progression of like familial homophobia and how in some ways you feel like it, in a sense it's worse now because there is this, the, there's no longer the excuse of like complete like separation between like heterosexual and homosexual people. And so the the idea used to be like, oh, well, if straight people just knew us, you know, if we came out and they saw us and they saw that we lived in their neighborhoods and we were in their families, then they wouldn't have it in them to be homophobic because they would know us. But as there is, you know, an increasing, like as the closet gets less deep, I guess, right? It doesn't seem like, that doesn't seem to be manifesting. So um, am I correct? Is that kind of like your, the gist? So interesting to listen to this. This is like, <laughs> <laughs> this is golden diamonds for a writer. I mean, who gets to hear, sit there with people discussing their book? Um, th there's, these people don't ever mention their families. Right. It's not like they're tr they have problems with their families or they're trying to get into their families or they're complaining. They don't have families. None of them do and they're living in poverty, and they're living in emotional anarchism. And that's why they can be so horrible to each other, because nobody in the world cares what happens to these people, and nobody cares how they act. And that's, that's what all the brutality comes from. And they also they have nothing to do with the gay movement or politics or anything. They never even mention it. Yeah. I think it's interesting to like think about um, after Dolores in conversation with something like Rap Bohemia, mm. um, which I read for the first time recently. Um, uh, and uh, what I'm, you know, I, there are like, like obvious crossovers um, uh, in, in, in terms of like the thematic content, you know, like a lesbian Lower East Side, um, but um, a really striking difference um, that I, I guess um, like also has to do with the kind of progression of the AIDS crisis. Um, that's like the, the really immediate context of rap bohemia. Um, um, but that's a book that I think is very much about, like it's a, like a novel that's very much about familial homophobia and like the kind of extraordinary cruelty um, of, or how like 
the cruelty of families toward their gay children and gay brothers and sisters, um, like facilitates, um, uh, uh, like, like, like enables um, certain uh, forms of relating to each other, like among among gay and lesbian and trans people. Um, uh, yeah, that was sorry, that was what I had to say about that. I think that that's interesting to think about in terms of like ta not talking about families versus like talking about families, but everything that comes up about the family in, in Rap Bohemia is is just like a site of extraordinary cruelty. Um, I guess to to Tina to your question um, about like you know. Okay, what's different in the past 30 years? Obviously, the kind of social texture of like um, queer f life vis-a-vis -vis the family in um, you know like in North America has changed. Um, that I think like on the one hand. It's a kind of um, bizarre optimism that um, uh, that that like effectively it's th th that like this form of familial homophobia is, is going to be um, like somehow scrubbed out um, again. Like this is part of the argument that you make sometimes I find like simply by by coming out. Um, and like I would say that the reason for that is that um, uh, gay desire is antipathetic towards. Um, like the nuclear family, structurally, um, and so like you keep on running. We keep on as like um, as LGBT people, like we keep on running into um, the same kind of ideological obstructions um, that like like that that vary and change in terms of their specific manifestations. But there is this structural kernel, um, and that's and that's why the, like um, this frustrates. A, I think a kind of like Whiggish progressive narrative. Um, about how this history is supposed to turn out. On the other hand, where you see a kind of like, I mean, this is, you know, like winding back the clock to the discourse about like five uh, to seven years ago, but where you see like a kind of Dan Savagey, like it gets better, or whatever, like, 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 when, when, like when everybody was looking at the onset of that rhetoric, that was really tied up in homonationalism. Like it was really tied up in a kind of middle class, largely white, gay like support for the state um, and the US state and like imperialism. Um, and so it's it's this kind of like dark side to um, uh, an apparent amelioration in like in in, in um, families loving their their gay kids, I think. Do you um how do you guys do you think that the narrator would like spend a lot of time on Facebook? <laughs> I in rereading, I was That's like, oh my question. god! It, like if this was written now, it would there would be no like wandering around like the East Village in the middle of the night, <laughs> stepping over junkies. It would all just be like obsessive Facebook stalking. Totally right. You know, she, she doesn't have any boundaries now, but there are actual like physical barriers between her and Dolores and her new and improved life. Yeah, she has to like go to the same bar that they used to drink to at just hang out in order to see like her just, where yeah. she always is. Um, <laughs> just like when you look on Facebook or Instagram, that thing you're looking for is mm -hmm. always gonna be there. Mm -hmm. But nobody can like rip the shirt off your back on Facebook, which is like <laughs> That's true. one of its only good qualities, I guess. <laughs> but in a way it definitely, I mean, I guess talking about like, talking about how, I guess I want to return to speaking of Facebook, like I want to return to how we're thinking about what has changed since like this book came out and like this progression of like, um, I guess like queer relating to the world over time. Um, just because this book itself, you know, even uh, there, there, there's like a pretty strong theme in After Dolores of like how it used to be. So like even now as we're sitting here and talking about like what would this be like now with like social media and how was it back then? Like After Dolores is also kind of preoccupied with how it used to be to be gay. Um, and I, I was just wondering if people kind of thought about if, if anyone had any thoughts around that. I mean, that was really interesting to me. Like, although it does seem like the the narrator isn't like this like feral like constant like you know obsession with Dolores in the moment there is also her thinking about um, the women that she knows and the women that she hears about who are older than her because she is very young you know young poor inexperienced as 
even though it seems like she kind of feels super jaded, but... I mean, the more things change, the more they stay the same. There are all of these characters in this book that are like, it's so easy for you kids now. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, and the now what you see what I mean. Like people, yeah. people are always just going to keep saying that. And even the thing that you were reading about, like gentrification and Avenue D and, uh, you know, it's like little did you know, it would just keep getting worse. Uh <laughs> The gentrification that is. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I think that's actually like, you know, in some ways, I think that this is a, like a really fascinating novel, especially to read in context of like, um, I'll, I'll say gay and lesbian literature of, of the 80s. Um, uh, and, I, and I use that formulation, I guess, advisedly in, in terms of um, like, you know, the, the, in in terms of the um, like milieus um, and the ways that um, like the the ways that these audiences like direct them th these books direct themselves to to their audiences, um, but like thinking about you know I think it's really easy and I'll say this as as like you know I'm in my mid twenties um, like I was born in the early nineties um, I. I like my first memories of encountering uh, HIV and AIDS were basically after the bulk of the crisis in like the global north was already, I don't want to say over, but like like attenuated by like the advance of antiretrovirals. Um, uh, Obviously, AIDS is still, still an epidemic, and everybody everybody here knows that, knows that. I'm not like trying to bolster whatever. You, you know what I mean? Um, but 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 like, so I, I think that there there can be a response. I'll say maybe especially maybe to be slightly unkind to the people of my generation. I think that there can be a response from like the queers of my generation to think like, you know, God, everything was so shitty in the 90s uh, and and like don't let don't let's talk about the 80s the 70s was the golden age um and then like you know act up happened and 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 everything got better um and like saved the day um like obviously this 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 narrative is like false in in lots of respects um uh and romanticizing in lots of respects and one one thing that i think is really interesting that like like after dolores actually helps like to, you to think about is how there are really long-term processes that are narrated here, like gentrification, which is like that is a phase of capitalist development that, like you know, that involves um, like real estate developers making bank on land in cities, and it's and it's a real and it is a long-term process. It is a, a decades-long process that also like you know has to be fought at every step of the way, but like the, effectively. We are still in that, you know, Sarah, when you write, like, you know, white people can go anywhere. Right. Again, that is even more true in every metropolitan center in the U.S. and Canada now than it was 30 years ago. Um, that's because it's the same process. Um, and, and, and that's, like, really helpful for thinking about, oh, we are still fighting this fight. Um, actually, I mean, in lots of ways, even though the people in this novel aren't, like, politicized, it is kind of a, it, it kind of, I think, like, really asks you, like, so which side are you on, huh? Um, and that that's pertinent. I think that's, like, really pertinent. I think the main thing that's changed is that New York is unaffordable now. Mm. I think that that's the most significant difference, because these are poor people who can actually get apartments, you know, and who, like, could survive on terrible wages and can... And also, the, that, I mean, in a way, you, you brought up homo-nationalism, Kay, but it's like this is at a time when white lesbians are, have no chance of assimilation at all. Mm -hmm. And so are in the underclass. And that's something that's changed, that white gay people now have this whole access to assimilation that at that time wasn't present. 
I just want, can I, just, I want to talk a little bit about um, how it was received at the time. Okay, yes, please. Um, because, you know, the, the thing that I was responding to at the, in the 80s, if you're talking about gay literature in the 80s, was the tyranny of positive images. That's what We've was. We've solved that. Yeah. <laughs> That's what was dominant. So that there had to, and, and the coming out story was the predominant form. So at a story where at, this thing about this is nobody is, re, is redeemed or redeemable in this. And, and so there's no coming out the other, other side. But um, because the protagonist is this wild alcoholic, everywhere I went, and this book, because of that, it was reviewed in the New York Times, and because of that review, it would, became like the, one of the first modern lesbian novels to be taken seriously. So it was translated all over the world. So I went all over the world. And everyone expected me to be a raucous alcoholic. <laughs> Everywhere I went, they would take me on these trash tours. <laughs> you know, like Madrid, seven bars, and it's four in the morning. And I was like, I can't do this. And, and like in, in Amsterdam, they put me in this house stocked with alcohol and red meat. And I was like, and then the, the person said, oh, you're just a little intellectual. <laughs> And I was like, yeah. I mean, if I was that person, I wouldn't be able to write this book. <laughs> right? So, so that, that was, um, but I, can I just tell how the book got published? Yeah. yeah. OK, so this is my third book. And my first book was called The Sophie Horowitz Story. And it was, I published when I was 24. And that book got published because my brother dressed up as a messenger and took around, OK, these are all books that were written on typewriters and took around the manuscript and dropped it off at publishers. And then they would reject it and send back the same manuscript, and then you would resend it to another publisher. That was the mechanism. And I got 61 rejections. And people were saying things like, you know, can't you just change the sexuality of the protagonist? This will offend librarians. I mean, they didn't know about librarians at the time. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, so this is like 1982 or 83 at this point. So I had a girlfriend who had another girlfriend, which we all did at the time, and <laughs> still do, but not me. But at, <laughs> And um, the other girlfriend was working as a temp at Scribner's. So she put it in an envelope with Scribner's letterhead and mailed it to this lesbian press in Tallahassee, Florida. And they thought they were getting it from Scribner's. So they were like, wow, Scribner's knows about us. So they published it. But they were, they had never published a Jewish book before. And so, I don't know if you, I don't have the cover here with me, but if you look at the cover, they basically made the Jewish character, Sophie Horowitz, look black. I mean, it's a really interesting, weird cover. And in the back, the, the cover text says, she's up to her Jewish earlobes in murder and intrigue. Anyway. Okay, so Jewish earlobes. <laughs> so <laughs> that book was the third lesbian detective novel. There had never, you know, it was a very unknown thing because um, I was in the first generation that was had always been out. So the generation before me had been in the closet first, then they would come out. So we were the first generation where underground lesbian culture and pop lesbian culture were the same. So we had the, you know. It made sense to take a popular genre form, like a detective novel, and put your lesbian content in it because it was radical to do that, if you can think way, way, way back. Because um, it was like, how dare you take our normal forms and put these, this kind of protagonist in? It quickly got co-opted. It quickly became very banal. And in fact, at one point, lesbian detective novels dominated lesbian literature because they became so, you know, the formula was very comforting for We're people. Very inquisitive. So. <laughs> Anyway, so the second book I wrote was called Girls, Visions, and Everything, and it was about Jack Kerouac. So uh, it was about this lesbian who reads on the road, and she wants to go on the road because she's a woman. All she has to do is go outside, and all these things happen to her. She doesn't even have to get on the road. <laughs> so, um, and so the book was like, quote, experimental, whatever that means. But it was influenced by Jack Kerouac. Well, so I sent it back to these lesbians in Tallahassee, Florida. And they're like, what is this? They didn't understand it because they wanted like a plot. So um, 
It ended up being published by a feminist press called Seal Press in Washington State, and they put me on a Greyhound bus tour around the country. And I went around the country in 86 by Greyhound bus, staying with like lesbians in their trailers and on their farms, and I mean, it was an incredible uh, experience, because I'm the most um, provincial person there is, you know, so it was kind of like, wow. Anyway, so then I wrote after Dolores, and I sent it to the people in Washington State, and they were going to publish it. But one day I was in the health food store, and you have to remember this is before there was no internet, okay? So nobody knew what anyone looked like. You know, people thought Madonna was black. I don't know if you realize that until MTV. I mean, nobody knew what anyone looked like. Anyway, um, I was in the health food store, and this girl came up to me, and she's like, are you Sarah? And I was like, yeah, because you couldn't like look, see what people's pictures were. She's like, you know, a lesbian I went to Smith with just got a job at Dutton, and you should send your next book to her. So this was this woman, Carol DeSanti, who was my age, and she was that same first generation to always be out. So she had gotten hired at Dutton by this guy named Bill Whitehead, who died of AIDS, but he was, uh, he published gay literature. He was one of the first people to publish gay literature. In fact, there's an award named after him now, the Whitehead Award. And he hired this out lesbian from Smith. So she, I w took the manuscript and went to the Dutton office. It was like a Park Avenue corporate office, and I dropped it off. And then she called me up like a week later and said, oh, I want this book. And she paid me $5,000. So I had to call the people in Washington State and tell them. And they were like, it's OK, it's OK. And then it got published. And then this thing happened, and the Times covered it. And we were all shocked. Because it was just a completely, it just never happened, never. And what's so interesting is that they treated it as a Jewish mystery novel. And they assigned it to this guy named Kinky Friedman, who had a novelty band called Kinky Friedman and the Texas Jew Boys. And he had just written a, a mystery novel. So he was the reviewer. This idea that gay, if you have gay content, it's a gay book and it has to be on the gay shelf and the gay people have to review it, that didn't happen until like 92. So in the early 80s, that was not in place yet, that niche market to control the literature. Anyway, that's, that's, the, back, that's the back story. Amazing. I, yeah. I do have to ask, like, so you weren't expecting, obviously, the reaction that it got. Were you expecting it to just be ignored? You're, were you expecting it to get, like, really negative attention? I mean... I thought it would only live in the under, in the subculture. Yeah. Because everything only lived in the subculture. We all, I only lived in the subculture, and because... <laughs> It's not like now where there's like actual queer people and what we say and do and think, and then there's like the corporation's queer people who drown us in their crap. <laughs> that, didn't, that other layer didn't exist. I mean, so everything was underground. There was no overground. So this type of thing, like to actually be seen by the apparatus was, um, was just remarkable. I mean, people, many people have stopped me for years and said that like, that was this big emotional moment for them. They couldn't give a shit about me, but because they saw a lesbian thing. I mean, the headline of the review was, she considered boys for five minutes. That was you know, unheard of to be in the New York Times. So that's, you know, that's, and it just about the solidarity thing, I recently had the, the third French edition came out, and I recently was in Paris and, and read from that edition. And this woman came up to me, and she's like, I love this book. I'm a sex worker. I'm a queer sex worker, and I've never read a queer book with a sex worker. And I'm like, sex worker? There's a sex worker in this book? And I'm like, oh, punkette. Because sex worker is a new word, you know? I just never, she was a go-go dancer. I didn't. I don't, the word sex worker doesn't appear, the concept doesn't appear in here. So that was just like translation through the generations. It was really, really interesting. I have a question, actually. Um, when you were, um, when you were, I mean, I love Punkette so much. I just want to like give her a big hug. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering, uh, when you were designing that character, you know, knowing that her murder was going to be the mystery that drives the story, what what motivated you to make her a go-go dancer in Jersey? Um, okay, first of all, it, I didn't. I don't write that way, so it's like to just yeah, yeah. no, hit, hit me. I mean, I just write it, and then later I fix it, and that means like making the story comes later. 
But because the person that I modeled it on was a go-go dancer, and she worked at this bar. And I went to this bar with my friend at the time, who's now, I think, chair of the history department at Rutgers or something. But we went to this bar and saw her. And this girl is now a TV producer in Florida. But yeah, no, I mean, these are all based on real people, people. Come on. These, every one of them is real. Yeah. <laughs> If anybody has a question or topic or anything like that, if you want to raise your hand, I'll bring you the mic. No, it's hard to be the first one. Oh, should I tell the Kathy Ackerb story? Okay. <laughs> Always. Yes. 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 <laughs> so just so you, get, you understand the background of me, like I did not go to an MFA program. I did not have any connections. I didn't have an agent. You know, I didn't have any of that. And, and I really was a waitress, and I worked at the first coffee shop in Tribeca when Tribeca was just gentrifying. It had been like a egg delivery industrial place. And they opened a coffee shop. And um, my, so the first artists that moved into Tribeca, I waited on them every morning. So I waited on Meredith Monk and John Kelly and all these people. Yvonne Rayner was my customer. For years, they'd be like, you look so familiar. <laughs> 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 um, anyway, um, so one day I was going to swim at the Pitt Street Pool. I don't know if people still swim there, but, and the Village Voice was, I bought the Village Voice, used to buy it, and I opened it, and there was a review of my book by Kathy Acker. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, and she really liked it. And I just like, I didn't know her, nobody was no, like nobody called her, you know, it wasn't like she wasn't like positioning herself by reviewing me. She just liked it. And then I, I got on my bike and I went to the Pitt Street pool and I dove in the water and I remember like I was swimming and I was like, oh wow. <laughs> <laughs> it was so amazing. Anyway. <laughs> Questions? Yes. When did I start? Yes. This is Jill and I have lived in the same building for 40 years and Sidel, and they're here. It's so nice. I started writing when I was six. I wrote, when I grow up, I will write books. <laughs> Anybody else? Well, if you guys have any really? last thoughts or comments or anything. <laughs> <laughs> I, I guess I have a question about the, the based on real people thing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I want to, will there ever be um, a tell-all about the, <laughs> and, and I ask this because, um, so when I, I read Rap Bohemia, I, I also stumbled across your, um, I guess a, a summary for people who haven't read it, um, it's really fantastic. Um, so I, I go out and find a copy. Um, and there is, the, the, the book has an antagonist, um, an, an antagonist novelist who's a closeted lesbian oh, and yeah. her name is Muriel K. Starr. And there's a rumor, there, there was a rumor, I take it, that this was based on Susan Sontag. But it's not. But it's, but it's not. And, and, then, and then, Sarah, you wrote a, a letter to the New York Times in 2003, I think, that said, um, and, and if I may quote, um, <laughs> It's not Susan, uh, uh, a closeted lesbian who's professionally successful, not Sontag. God knows there are plenty of candidates. <laughs> this guy got in his head that it was Susan Sontag, and it appeared everywhere. It appeared in this Susan Sontag biography that it was based <laughs> on her. And then Zoe Leonard's father was a, a TV critic at the Times, I think. And he wrote it in a thing in the Times. And I was like, no, no. And someday I'll tell who it really is. OK. okay, okay. <laughs> what better opportunity? <laughs> you have to be careful. You know, it's interesting when you're around a long time, because people come to power. I mean, this week, I've been watching some people get some real power. And you have to be careful, right, Amen. Julian? Amen. <laughs> Anybody else have anything they want to say or any questions? Yeah. 
Um, uh, having recently gotten out of the, the coffee business myself as like a creative person, I, when I was reading the book, um, the parts where you write about working in a restaurant really resonated with me to the point where I, I circled one part and was like, this is my life. Um, where you're talking about how it's sort of like you leave your body in a way when you're dealing with a, with a big rush of people. And um, it's like terrible, but also kind of thrilling, right? Um, and I guess I, I just, I'm, I'm really interested in hearing you talk about like, I guess the experience of writing the book while working a job like that, that can be so demanding. I mean, I really like how you wrote about it. Um, and yeah, I'm just curious about that experience. Well, I mean, all the balancing. customer lines are directly from my customers. Yeah. So I would just write it on the pad, you know, while they were talking to each other. <laughs> Can I ask actually a, a question re like related to that? I mean, you talk about like, um, like you know, taking parts from your actual day job and and people you actually know and, and turning them um, into a novel. Um, I'm wondering. So I know that like part of Rap Bohemia appeared as an excerpt in the new narrative anthology, um, and um, like just just to speak of like a movement that's predicated on like um, gay desire and gay community and a lot of gossip um, and a lot of like people you actually know and things that you know sort of like like actually happen to you and that end up in and that end up in your work and I'm wondering if you can talk um, maybe a little bit about because you know like you're talking about Kathy Acker who gets associated with this movement um, I'm wondering if you can just like talk a little bit about your relationship to new narrative I have nothing to do with new narrative. They, 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 this, is a, this is a movement, I love them. These are my favorite people, my favorite writers. They're in San Francisco, and they call themselves new narrative. It's like Robert Gluck and uh, Kevin Killian and, and Dodie Bellamy and these great writers. Camille and Roy. Camille yeah. Roy. And, and they say that all their friends are also a new narrative, and they <laughs> made a huge an anthology, and they put us all in, and that's wonderful, and we're all happy to be there, and Lynn Tillman is in it, yeah. she's not new narrative either, but, <laughs> and Kathy, Kathy was like the head of, of the not new narrative, of the people <laughs> there, but it's fine. Wait, can you say more? <laughs> well, Kathy was the dominant figure there, and she was close friends with all these people. I mean, I was m much younger than her, you know, so, I could worship her and then she would be nice to me, but apparently if you were her equal, she was very competitive, is what I've heard. Mm. You know, so Bob Gluck or um, Lynn, they had to compete with her, but I never did. But um, her advice, if you ever had love problems, her advice was, Sarah, you have to beg. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway. <laughs> what else can I tell you? Yes, <laughs> hi. Like, oh, New York back in the day, and it was great then, which mm. there were It was part better. There, <laughs> well, yeah, are you nostalgic for that? Because there were parts that were better, and now there are parts that are better, specifically no, around, like, queer visibility. No, it's not better now. It's okay. too expensive. Right, right, okay. Rent is yeah. too expensive, but in terms of, like, queer visibility, do you think it's better? Or worse? No, no. Gay people used to be the most interesting people. And they used to be the most creative people, innovated everything, and now it's so boring. <laughs> I mean, well, Will and better. Grace is boring, but I would argue that like many people in this room probably are not like a minstrel like Will and Grace and are still really interesting. Who are you? We, <laughs> we know each other, actually. We've met. What's your, what's your name, though? RJ. Oh, you're RJ. Yeah. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah. okay. okay. <laughs> But I, I mean, because I think that is the problem. I think queer visibility has become so prominent, but it is a minstrel show. But, and then it escapes the fact that there are like really interesting creative careers happening everywhere that have no relationship to what we see whatsoever. Right, but those are two separate things. There are always great people. And there are always great people with, with visions and who drive those visions. Right. But this city is so racist now. Well, the country it is racist. It always has been, but... But the, the racial segregation is so profound. Take, you know, here we are. Look at the characters in this book versus this room. Yeah. I mean, the book is far more integrated than, than the reality here. But wait a second. But um, 
like I teach on Staten Island and yeah. my classroom I have 15 nationalities so it's like but the but white people in New York are now separate from everybody else so everyone else is mixed with each other and white people have separated and that's the tragedy of New York is that public space is segregated so you know that's terrible that's what killed because what, what makes her a city great is the mix that's what urbanity is and if you don't have a mix you have a dead city I used to live here well, where am I going to go? I, I don't know. I mean, what's better people. than New York? I mean, that's the, wh where do you go? I mean, I'm, people think I'm confrontational. I don't know why, but other people don't. Other people no, I'm just all, I'm York always, I'm so like interested me. in this idea of like queer visibility because I do think like in, in one, like RuPaul was just on the cover of like the New York Times Magazine, right? Like that is a huge sort of, for me, like a positive in terms of queer visibility that you have this person that's been around forever. I don't feel that way. Okay. I thought that RuPaul Charles is star booty was great queer visibility, if you, if you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Oh, Earl Dax. Only the old people know. Yes. Hey, now that Patty Smith has made a comeback since you wrote After the War, are you equally as fond of her, especially in light of how, I know a lot of people think she's been kind of banking off of the old school downtown well, who am I to accuse someone of banking <laughs> off the old <laughs> The thing about, like, I read her first book, and I thought, wow, she doesn't like lesbians. It was kind of weird. She had a very high ick factor around women, and it really shocked me because I quote some of her poetry in here, which I never actually, I don't think, got rights to, but <laughs> it was really, her, her work about women was just incredible. Um, but she still has that thing like where you go to see her and you feel like she's playing just to you. You know, she's remarkable in that way. And, I, and her performance of Bob Dylan at the Nobel Prize was just incredible. So she's a great artist. That one line, didn't she? She's a great artist. She is great, yeah. yeah. Anybody else have any last questions? Okay. Hello. So um, I have not read this book yet. I'm really excited to pick up a copy after this. But in the in the section you read at the beginning and kind of what you all touched on a little bit was this idea of, and even the narrator has it, has it too, right? When she's talking to Punkett of like, I don't understand anymore. Like this person's so much younger than me in this way. And like she has it differently than I do. And then kind of this idea of like, what would this book be like now if these characters had Facebook? And I guess I would like just to hear kind of more your thoughts on like this idea of like the more things change, the more things stay the same. Like as you said, like is 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 the idea that the struggle changes a myth? Is is this idea that it is actually different for a previous generation? Like I, I would I'm and I would just like to hear more of your thoughts on Well, that. I mean, we're living in a national cataclysm. Yeah. So it's different. Yeah. <laughs> but like, but I mean, it, clearly yeah. it's different. But I. I don't really know how to... Well, let me say it this way. I, I just wrote another murder mystery, okay, after 30 years. It's my, my, I wrote another one, and it's coming out in September. Right. It's called Maggie Terry, and it's, it's set in the present. So if you feel like reading it, you can see whether I, you think things have changed. <laughs> and, and let's end on that note. But thank you, everybody, for your support. It means everything to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks all of you for a great conversation.